fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with the intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each episode we try and have a conversation with a contemporary thinker to advance the possibilities of architectural thinking and we are hoping to continue to do that today. Uh, I'm today talking to my good friend and colleague Mark Jasenbeck, a conversation that I recorded when I visited him a few weeks ago at MIT. He's currently teaching the Global History Survey, and so we decided to sit down together with a mic in front of his students and TAs uh, and have a conversation that tracks a number of topics, but in particular the history and future of the global project, our lives and careers, and of course the future of architecture itself. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and I hope you're staying healthy and safe and washing your hands consistently in this strange day and age of the coronavirus. Enjoy the conversation. All right, hi Mark, good to see you again. Hello it's everyone, <laughs> good to see you here in Cambridge. It's nice to have a conversation with an audience. I feel like I'm Jay Leno and we have a live studio <laughs> audience. <laughs> we do. So, <laughs> you know, the tears are gonna hold up the laugh and, and, and clap placard, so please be ready uh, to participate in the appropriate moment. But, uh, you know, Mark, what, it's been 20 years, hasn't it, been since we started to have our conversation about the global project. And I think it was about a uh, little before 9-11 when the Twin Towers came down and uh, cultural xenophobia took on with a big force in the United States uh, that uh, we started to do this project. Uh, but I, in many ways, I think the project was long brewing, wasn't it? That, uh, I mean, I'm certainly, uh, certainly the sort of events of 9-11 gave it a big boost. But the project was long brewing. Uh, uh, f for me, it in part, it came out of thinking out of post-colonial theory, post-structuralism, sort of undoing Eurocentrism. These were all things that were big in the academy in general mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s uh, when I was in grad school. That's kind of the trajectory I associate it with in, in my specific career. Uh, in that sense, I, you know, I see this as a continuation of that work. Mm -hmm. How do you see it? Well, I always thought you had the advantage because you came from India yeah. to the States and you sort of had to travel halfway around the world in, in you know in a, in a very real way yes your biography and so yes forth, you know. straight from Chandigarh to Ithaca by the way yeah yeah, yeah. I mean the culture <laughs> shock yeah. is quite St profound still recovering yes and <laughs> so I mean I was trained my parents are my mother Swiss my father's Polish European I mean even though there was you know there were immigrants you know Europe was like yeah I mean second nature yeah right? yeah yeah and Eurocentrism I was baked in, yeah, was in baked spite in. of you being uh, of Jewish extraction yeah, yeah. and all having all been thrown out of uh, Europe. Yeah, exactly, yeah. all that type of stuff. So, <laughs> but it was still baked in, and then I went to, you know, architectural school in Switzerland, and, you know, Eurocentrism was Eurocentrism, and yeah. like, what was the problem? You know? <laughs> There's no problem. There's no problem, that's right, yeah. Didn't even <laughs> notice it, and then I, then in the 80s, when I came to MIT to get my PhD, uh, everyone was critiquing Eurocentrism, but no one knew what to do about it. Right, right, right. It was like, oh my God, Eurocentrism is bad, but it was like, what do you do? And, and, and one of the consequences of that was kind of area studies and retreat into, that's well, right. areas of specialization. I mean, that was that's part right. so of the that, So the yeah. answer was area studies. You, you study North Africa, you study South Asia, you study uh, Japan, right. you know, or something like that, right? Yeah. And you sort of burrow into those places, and then you're safe uh, from the charge of being a Eurocentric. Right, right, right. And so you become experts. You become an expert yeah. in, in these places, and you're safe, and then you're not a Eurocentric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that seemed to be like fine. I mean, okay, that was what we were told, you know. And, so and the other thing was tokenism, right? I mean, that well, I remember yeah. my first year TAing. 
uh, this exact same course, 180, 181 mm -hmm. at Cornell. At Cornell, 181. Uh, right. You know, a certain faculty member was my professor, uh, and he said, uh, oh, Vikram, you're from India, so you must do me a lecture <laughs> on Indian architecture. Yes. So <laughs> it was like, you know. <laughs> about which you knew nothing. About which I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was a Corbusier yeah. modernism <laughs> expert. <Yes>. Exactly. <laughs> right. That's right, yeah. The yeah. assumption is if you came from a certain place, you were supposed to know it you yeah, know, and yeah, identify yeah. with it and yeah, yeah, so yeah. forth like that. No. So there were a lot of really bad um, know, consequences to the critique of Eurocentrism, which yeah. were collateral consequences yeah. that people sort of didn't quite anticipate. Yeah. And so by the 1990s, uh, I mean, when I taught the survey course, I was handed a syllabus, and it was, well, there's first Egypt because they made the pyramids, and then there's the Greeks because they made the Parthenon, and then there's the Romans, and then there's the Middle Ages, and da 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 da, -da and then it's Frank Lloyd Wright and Corbusier. That's yeah. right. And they said, you know, like, you know, what's the problem with that? You know, and I put that in the garbage. But it was like there were no other syllabuses available, right? No one was teaching anything other than that, right? And so you call in the person who teaches Chinese architecture. Uh, which I did the first time, and that person gave a really boring lecture, <laughs> I must say, <laughs> about on brackets. brackets. Yes, on brackets. On brackets. I yes. still remember that lecture, and half, not half, so practically the entire class fell asleep. You know. And, and there's this thing, you know, there's this entire sort of <laughs> well-baked canon of Western mythology, which goes from, you know, uh, the Greeks to Le Corbusier, right? And then you show those mm -hmm. pictures from Vesuvian architecture. There's a Greek temple on one side and a car on the other side, and magic, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, but for the rest of the world, you show brackets. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <coughs> so that was the the level of scholarship at that time. So I mean, I know this is all of this was before most of you were born, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a little bit. Anyway, we're talking 1880s, 1890s. Yeah. Um, yeah I'd, uh, I'd hate Anybody born in the 80s over <laughs> here? <at the> you <laughs> don't count. 90s, you're all in 1990s something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I see some 1990s. Okay. Yeah, okay. Right. We decided we had enough of all that. We wanted to do something different, but we didn't know what it was. Started in 1999, 2000. Uh, 99, 2000, yeah. That's when we started. We, started, we were you teaching from these old textbooks, and we decided yeah. they were terrible, these, mm -hmm. these exact survey that you all are doing today. Mm -hmm. So we threw all that in the garbage, and then he and I you know, yeah. you know, went to a bar or something like that, you know, and we were decided we got to do something different. But we had no idea, really, what we were going to do. And it basically emerged into this you know, uh, over the last 20 years. And so, but we knew we weren't going to do uh, you know, start the story, the textbook that we had used starts the story in Stonehenge. And, you know, I don't know, we'll, we'll talk about Stonehenge, but it's, as you notice, we haven't gotten there yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll do that on Wednesday, right? So instead of starting there, we're sort of like showing that there's a lot of history that happened long before. It's an interesting history. I mean, not just sort of stuff, you know. Um, but so instead, the, in the book, we took the conceit <coughs> that uh, one way to crack open the sort of normal trajectory of history, quote unquote, mm -hmm. <coughs> is to organize the text by time cuts, right? That's right, that's right. So we, we did, uh, so we took like 800 CE, you all have the textbook, right? And, uh, and you, all, uh, you see what's happening around the globe, 1,000, what's happening around the globe, 1,200, what's happening around the globe, and so on. And that's how we organize the textbook. That's right. And, so and, and yeah. many of the teaching modules. That's right, because at that time it was linear. It starts old and goes to the modern in a linear sort of way, right? Mm. And, if, and if you're not on that line, let's say if something happened in China or in India or whatever that wasn't in that line, it was just like not relevant. So I think everyone today sort of would realize that's really a bad way to do it in the world that is round, right? I mean, the world is round. It's a globe. It's not a line, right? So we, we came up with time cuts. And the, sort of the idea was, in other words, like if you're an architect today and you get a degree at MIT and you get a job, you know, it's like, what's happening in the world? You know, what's, where's the exciting place to be, right? So if you are got an architectural degree in the ninth century, what's the exciting place to be, right? Where would you want to go? Mm. Right? Now, in the ninth century, the last place you wanted to go would be Europe. There's nothing happening. It's pretty, you know, right. boring. Right. You'd want to go to Southeast Asia, which we'll 
go to, right? <laughs> gangbusters, temples. Well, we're going gangbusters, Borobudur, temples up, you know, um, I mean, things that just amaze you completely, right? So you would get huge. your parents to buy you a ticket to Southeast Asia, and that's where you would go. So that's where we say that's where we'll start our chapters, because that's where the exciting thing was happening in the ninth, ninth century. Now, of course, it depends on Bikram and I making a decision, because I would say Borobudur, he would say Shmorobudur. We were uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> sometimes he'd win, sometimes I'd win, and so forth like that. <laughs> but it was like, where do we think, you know, the exciting architecture was made in the ninth century? Where was it made in the 10th century, and so forth? Right? Mm -hmm. So we would value, make these value judgments as opposed to saying, oh, it's, it's a line and it all sort of ends today, right? There are other lines. There, there are many, many lines, many, many right? Lines. We just haven't even begun to even sort of see all these lines yet, right? Because scholarship is very slow. Drawings are, are sometimes non-existent. That's why I'm asking you to make drawings <laughs> because you're doing what, what I do almost every other day. Like, I want to talk about that temple. There are no but, drawings. But how do you think, you know, 20 years on, <clears throat> how do you think this sort of concept of the time cut has held up? Do you think it's still working? Yeah, uh, I'm, 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 I'm I don't know. I th I've heard some complaints about it. Well, that's because people are <laughs> too stuck in their ways. And well, people feel e. that the downside of this uh, time cut model is that it see, feels encyclopedic, right? that you know it's just one thing after the other mm -hmm. and we don't give them good stories right we need stories so that no. was one of the problems yeah. we ran into yeah. right that uh, that uh, we were relying on faculty and TAs to sort of create new stories out mm -hmm. of the material mm -hmm. of a particular mm -hmm. time cut but teachers want mm -hmm. pre-packaged stories that's right to yeah. teach in surveys so that students don't go to sleep too mm -hmm. much, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right? That's right. So yeah. we try to fix that problem by making longer mm -hmm. uh, beginning essays. That's right. Yeah, but we did that in the third edition. In the third yeah. edition. Yeah. But there's a sort of a tension That's in right. the book about telling big stories of the world mm -hmm. and keeping it open mm -hmm. through all the case studies in a time cut that's right. To uh, make other interpretations possible. Do you think that's a contradiction in terms? It is a contradiction, but that's the the drama of the, the teaching learning yeah. thing. It puts more stress on the teacher. Yes. You know, to sort of try to figure out the puzzle. Yeah. Right. So I figured out the puzzle in the way best way I could, and Brickham has done it in his way. Mm -hmm. But someone, hopefully, in uh, India, in an architectural school in India. We'll look at this material and maybe say, oh, I want to put emphasis on a slightly different way. Yep. So we want, we want that. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's why it's called A, not the. A, a history of yeah, gold, yeah, yeah, not yeah. the. Right? So, so in some sense, we want to throw out lots of stuff so that someone can say, oh, this building is important for me for whatever reason, right? right. And emphasize that, whereas in a lecture, um, you know, I might not even mention it. That's right, that's right. right. So I've heard you don't even teach the Parthenon. Yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not going to teach the Parthenon, I'm sorry. In this course, there is no <laughs> Parthenon? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Isn't that heresy? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> 20 years ago, that would have been heresy. That would have been, <laughs> I, they, I would not have gotten tenure. Right? That would have been really, really, really bad. You know? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but now, my point is that there's, it, it's so much interesting architecture all over the world, it really doesn't matter what you're required to teach, right? Unfortunately, MIT, no one asks me what I'm teaching, right? Because you're an old fuddy-duddy professor. No, no. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you're not the young Turk anymore. No, it could be, <laughs> but I think MIT, they just assume, you know, it's, it's a very open-ended place to begin with. Oh, uh, okay. I don't have to turn in my curriculum to anybody except my students and some TAs and so forth. And right? they don't say anything. And no, well, they care, <laughs> but... <laughs> But there are so many bu interesting buildings. The, right. this, the, the problem of teaching isn't to, s to force certain buildings down certain you know, throat because someone did it 30 years in a row, but rather to continuously make the project of architecture production interesting, right? And in, in, the, in build sort of a global ethos out of that. So I don't know how it is with, with the, your students here, but when I teach this course in Seattle at the University of Washington, and various other people, places, you know. I'm halfway through the quarter, we are on the quarter system. 
you know, one day always there will be a student who will come back and say, I'm a bit confused. What is the global anyway? <coughs> you know, what is your answer to that question? I say, f let me know at the end of the semester. <laughs> 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 so the global, <coughs> uh, I mean, because there are many ways to answer that, but I would say in the context of a course like this, yeah. it, the global isn't in one lecture, it's, it's, it's cumulatively. Okay, but I want right. my two-minute elevator pitch. Two minute elevator pitch is you're going to have to sit through <laughs> 24 <laughs> lectures. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's, you have to, it, it, there's some effort. Yeah. In, in, in global isn't something that you have instinctively in you. Yeah. It's something you've got to want to have. Mm -hmm. right? Not everyone wants it in equal doses. Let's try it again, but if I'm the dean and I'm, you're trying to get funding for this, mm -hmm. you know, how do you make this? You know, <coughs> we've got to be able to pitch it. I mean, I thought that, you know, one of the slides uh, that uh, I thought you made in one of our sort of global history presentations, it's a, a, it's a world opening uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. inculcation, right? That's right. If, if building the canon or trying to teach the greatest works of a certain civilization is a world closing attitude, mm -hmm. I think the global is a world opening attitude, right? Uh, and not only world opening in the sense of being uh, open to other cultures and people and mm -hmm. places and histories, but also an opening towards other, other ways of thinking, right? Absolutely, that's right, yeah. And, 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 and architecture does that very well because it operates at many scales, you know, very intimate scales to very large scales. Mm -hmm. It operates at social scales. It operates at so the scales of materials, right. the scales of productions, the scales of use, and so forth. So it's, it has all these layers in it that allow one to sort of see how it itself is already, uh, you know, making a building, it's already sort of opening something, right? Right. And if you do it in places that you're unfamiliar with, right. you sort of say, oh, I see, you know, different ways of making, different ways of thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it does become world opening, and it's, you know, as opposed to, let's say, reading a poem uh, by a, a, a Chinese poet is world opening in some sense. You'd say read it in translation. You'd have to know something about the poet and so forth like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm very That's architecture centric. I would say architecture gives you <laughs> even more than what a poem could give you because of all these layers of, of, of uh, trying to understand what it is. Okay, let's get into that a little bit. This, your architecture centrism, uh, which I intersect with complexly, let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one could say, I, this podcast is called Architecture Talk, and, but I interview people from fashion, theater, dance, poetry, <laughs> physics, philosophy, astrophysics, everybody, because I consider everything to be architecture. Mm -hmm. That's one way to think about architecture. Mm -hmm. you know, there are, we are sitting in front of MIT majors, you're all probably doing, I don't know, chemistry, math, something, I don't know. Some like architectures. <laughs> some, some architecture, yes. <laughs> but, uh, but from my perspective, but that's one way to think about architecture. Mm -hmm. Architecture is everything because architecture is the sort of framework for life and all of us are dealing with life, right? Architecture is made of atoms, so we need physics. Architecture involves chemistry, so we need chemists, mm -hmm. so architecture uh, needs astrophysics because, uh, as we are learning in our Biennale project, you know, uh, the steel that holds up our buildings is made in supernova explosions. So, so architecture is everything. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean by architecture, or do you mean architecture something more specific? Uh, <coughs> I, I, I definitely can go with there. Go okay. with that. That's yeah. not a, I don't have any resistance to that. Yeah. Um, I would say, however. Perhaps maybe I'm then here, maybe somewhat more conventional. I'm thinking in the School of Architecture, ultimately I've got to explain the hard bits. Mm -hmm. Hard the bits? The hard bits of all of that, right? Yeah. The you know, things that we might call buildings. Ah, buildings. Yeah. But so you are mean locate architecture to buildings. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> small b. Small b. Which can be very broadly understood. Uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. right. But nonetheless, some things that shape because there, there, these things put together like magnets, all sorts of variety of activities. Mm -hmm. 
from their production to their use and so forth. Right? And that end result of all that is, is this thing that we call architecture. Right? So well, I'm uh, not interested in the end resultedness of it, but in how those things actually put, bring different social, economic, political, geopolitical forces together mm -hmm. and then produce something. Sure. So the historian's job is to sort of go in reverse, you know, and find those stories that sort of explain then how the thing got there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's 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 sort of a little bit like um, uh, a car. You know, we get in the car and we drive it. We press the gas pedal and we go. Right? Yeah. And that's sort of how we often treat that's architecture. That only works in Teslas, by the way. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. But in the old days, there was something like <laughs> called a carburetor. Cl clutch, right? you know, gears. Well, then th <laughs> there was a carburetor, which was this magical, magical which thing. Which would get flooded all the <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, which would get flooded. Right. Which put the air <laughs> and the gas together, right. and it made a little explosion. So it's the carburetor that moved the car, right, 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 not, right. Not, not anything else. And so what is the relationship between the thing that's mo doing the work of moving it, right. the dynamics, right. and the thing that is a sort of the object itself? Right, right, right. So in some sense, well, looking yeah. under the hood yeah. right, of all of that, right? Yeah. I mean, I can see that from the historiographical perspective, that we are trying to you know, weave in all the forces and all the sort of complex of society, social, cultural eco economy that goes into the production of a single work of architecture or a single building, let's say. Singleish thing. Singleish thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's one <laughs> way to look at it, yeah. and that's part yeah. of the conceit of the Biennale project that yeah. we are putting yeah. together, yeah. to be shown in Venice uh, in May onwards. So that's the sort of back project in a sense, you know, how to account for the large textile of history uh, that that makes a, a work. Mm -hmm. But let's also sort of project this into the future, all right. I mean, we can say in the future, the same thing continues. We'll continue to make sort of buildings like this, uh, and a and, and, uh, and whole cosmos of thinking is going to be uh, f w feeding into it. Mm -hmm. But the f in the future, we are also sort of all dedicated to, at least theoretically, to this business called cross-disciplinary thinking, interdisciplinary work, the big problems of the world, the big questions of the world are at the intersections of disciplines. Just the physicists or the chemists are not going to solve climate change, uh, and so on and so forth. But that, mm -hmm. that for us to be prepared for the future, mm -hmm. we have to learn to be able to step out of our disciplinary uh, frameworks mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and think in some other ways. What is that? W don't you think that that's a way to rethink architecture? It is. I hope that we're doing that. Yeah, in, I mean, you know, in some wh sense. where are we going with that? Well, well, first, you know, the idea, you know, we in MIT we have physics and chemistry and da 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 da, right? And all of those things are great. They're disciplines. I mean, as we understand that, and they're departments, and you get degrees and professors and all that type of stuff. This was all the invention of the 19th century, and was that's one of right. The it's pretty great. Old. Inventions, but also now we realize one of the great mistakes of all time, right? Because it, it, it forced every solution down one rabbit hole. And one pinnacle. You got PhDs and expertise and that's so right, on. Yeah. That's right. And finally, it's only now that we're realizing that story is coming to an end. So it's, it's, it's molecular, biomolecular engineering something, right? And at MIT is embracing many of these sort of hybridicness, you know, very openly. And what did you say, hybridicnesses? Hib I like it. It's a new word, yeah. <laughs> <Go on>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, because you realize in the day, the day when you can ask a physicist, you know, solve this problem, you know, yeah. and implement it, yeah. right? That's, that's, those days are finished. Yeah, the Manhattan right? Project's yeah. long gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, you know. Because we know, it, you know, it takes more people in the room. Yeah. But but we're barely five years into that. Right. Or 10 right. years, maybe, something like that. Barely five years into that. Right. And so you're the first generation which is sort of going through, I mean, 
I had to unlearn my f the faith in one being the one discipline will is all I need you need to do in order to sort of embrace yourself as a, in the global world, right? Mm. Your generation, I mean, we're not that far apart, but still, you felt the your barely, you barely, barely, barely. You barely. Still, like I still had to struggle against against that. You guys, on the other hand, right, are already sort of immersed in the shadow of the breakdown of these ideas that, you know, architecture, I, when I was taught architecture, there was no doubt what it was. Yes. We all knew what architecture was. You go and make a building. <laughs> you know, you know, if you can't do that, then don't show up. Right? Today, architecture is landscape, it's planning, it's urbanism, it's real estate, it's uh, climate change, it's muckleted change, it's uh, agriculture, it's urban, it's peri-urban, super-urban, anti-urban. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow. You know, it's once again, you know, planetary. And it's ethics, <coughs> and it's uh, planetary, yeah. and it's transgender considerations, yeah. right, yeah. and it's uh, supernova. And it's uh, yeah. supernova <laughs> thinking, and it's yeah. uh, 3D printing, and it's molecular engineering, exactly, and it's right. uh, yeah. bio, go bio building on Mars. Foam, and bio foam, yep. building out of foam. What do you call this? The uh, ooze, the yeah. slime, ooze, you know. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so it's sort of like up for grabs, but it becomes much more interesting. It, and this should have happened 50 years ago. Mm. I mean, the thing is, why is it happening now? And not just imagine it happened 50 years ago. Well, 50 years ago, we were running the Holocaust in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there were people were busy with other things. Yeah. But you could sort of say, <laughs> why did it take so bloody long to realize that the world is complicated? Intersectionalities are important. Mm. Crossings are important. Mm. Expertise is still important. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you still need to have know-hows and consequences and expertise. But yeah, yeah. to be an expert today in the singular is in some sense sort of now insufficient to solve some of these large things that we want to talk about. Right. right? So, so, so why how did it take so I don't Blankety know. blank long, you could sort of say. Well, we've got a long time to go. I mean, science and modern thinking is barely 200 years mm -hmm. old. Mm -hmm. You know, we, let's give mm -hmm. it another 2,000, 5,000 years, and then we will see, okay. you know, where this project takes us, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not going to solve it in our lifetimes or even their lifetimes. You know, it's probably going to be, mm -hmm. uh, we'll probably see improvements in another 100 years. But, but if we were to try and start to blue sky this, you know, uh, what are what are your thoughts on the aspiration for the global project? You know, what might be the world of the future? You know, where could we take this? What does this imagine as a vision of the globe or the planet or the solar system or the galaxy? <coughs> well, if if we you know zoom ahead into something of the future, right? Mm. I, I, I think you're philosophically, the only position is to be a fatalist because you have to admit the fact that we're, you know, at the moment we're just a transitory thing on a, on a, on a, on a path, the human. And you've got a set amount of time to do that. And then I mean you and me or yeah, the all of us, us as humans? humans? Us as humans, right? Humans yeah. as a species? Yeah, yeah we're, we're, yeah, we're yeah. just air, right? Equivalent of maybe dust. You're talking it quantum physics or you're talking metaphorically? No, I'm talking metaphorically. The humans are, are sort of the equivalent of dust uh -huh. in the airflow of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay? true. Okay? Right. You mean like the universe is 13.5 billion years old? Yeah, exactly. Years old right. and yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere there's some dusty clouds down yeah, there, and that yeah. was the humans. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah okay. okay. So you have to, I think, almost embrace that inconsequentiality in order to release yourself from the enforcement of some sort of ethical purity that is going to save you or solve you in some sort of mandate, uh, sort of from heaven or mandate from right. somewhere, right? Yeah, I mean, that's like pre-19th century sort of vision that somehow we are at the, cul the, uh, the culmination of something and that we are going to deliver something, right? We're not. Yeah, we're not. I'm saying, that's right. I'm but critiquing that's, that. That's, got, that's yeah. Uh, yeah, agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, if, but, but that doesn't explain like what we're going to yeah. do tomorrow in my lecture. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> if we're just dust, then why are we even bothering? <coughs> yeah, you know. that's the question. Okay. So there's a dialectic. There's no dialectic. It's no, there is. <laughs> <laughs> why bring Hegel in? So this is <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Which is, 
the here and now. Yeah. You know. So we could just sit under the tree out there in the front yard of, of MIT and cross our legs and mm, wait until we become dust. That would be the Buddhist way, yeah. Yeah, the Buddhist way, right? So mm -hmm. That's one way. Or you can come to my lecture on Wednesday and we can keep slogging through the realities of, <laughs> of who we are. And I think that's extremely important to have that optimism that we in, as humans on the planet can begin to self-realize ourselves through history. Okay, that's Kierkegaard or something like that. Well, a little bit more Hegel probably. Than Kierkegaard. <laughs> okay, Kierkegaard some, would some be sort of like, it would be all sad and yeah, but It's sort of a mix between Hegel yeah. and Kierkegaard. Yeah, yeah. But we're still that's in right. the 19th century. I'm trying to get to the 21st. <laughs> 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 well, I'm still think that there's some, you know, that we have to, history has to mean something. Otherwise, why would we have done 20 bloody years of this stuff? Oh, so now you're asking me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think history means something, but I think uh, one of the implications of this book <coughs> was that even this book is so limited. This is the point that mm. I thought you established by doing uh, the architecture of first societies, mm -hmm. right? Because this only goes like bloody 3,000, 4,000 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. right? right? And your book starts at 300,000 mm -hmm. years. All right. When you look at this book mm -hmm. in that perspective, mm -hmm. this is just like a mm -hmm. piece of like recent yeah. uh, right. fiction. Yes. Correct. <laughs> yes. And so that opens up the the, the, the broader question of uh, uh, you know the uh, the planetary question. Mm -hmm. Like yes, it is true. Actually, you know, human uh, we, we mean we're hundreds of thousands of years, mm -hmm. and we are in fact a complex consequence of uh, evolutionary processes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, there is uh, we are uh, we are we are of the world and of the universe and of the very ethos of atomic selves that runs the universe. So there is actually a 13.5 billion year old mm -hmm. uh, tr uh, trajectory, certainly not teleology to us. Uh, so it opens up this very large. Uh, uh, physics, astrophysics mm -hmm. questions for yep, us, yep, right? Absolutely. So for me, that also makes it very optimistic uh, because the universe is not about to sort of finish very mm -hmm. soon. I mean, even if we produce climate change over here, the Earth's going to go on. Uh, we might sort of go off the planet, but the Earth will definitely recover. Yeah, the cockroaches are going to have Cockroaches, their, their probably the algae <laughs> and the plankton. The, you know, the, we have survived. We have had five major extinctions. So we'll, you know. Anyway, th let's not stay Kierkegaard. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is uh, the question of the implications of global thinking for the big questions of our time, let's say climate change or technology, and the future of human civilization is to produce the possibility of another way of thinking the world and another way of being on this planet and in this uh, universe. Mm -hmm. I think so. And I think in that way it intersects very well with the, um, uh, you know, in recent philosophy on uh, quantum physics, uh, mm -hmm. people like Canberrad and people like I agree, yeah. But it still takes the effort to get to those places. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can't just sort of read a book and say, I'm there. Yeah, yeah. Right. So in that sense, it's sort of not philosophy as such, you know, where you can sort of say, well, no, like, what's your philosophy? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you five lines, I got this is my philosophy, right? And okay, I'm, I'm done, mm -hmm. right? As if that's some sort of baked into everything I'm doing. You got to sort of earn the right to do that, to yes. To, to yeah. have that perspective. Yes, right? yes. And that work, the labor, the yeah. effort. Yeah. Right? It comes in different ways. Yeah. Right? But a lot of it, I would say, I mean, in some sense, the way I see the world is like 90% of that is autodidactic. Autodidactic? Yes, yes. You've got to want to do that. So these guys shouldn't be in class? They, they should <laughs> be in class. But they have to want, <laughs> I don't say want to be in this class, I would have presume, not presume, <laughs> but they have to want to know more than what they know now. Yeah. Which I'm presuming this is just all of you, I'm just going to give it's you that. It's just a distribution that. requirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 right, right. Um, and if you, ha if you want to know more than what you know now, yeah. right, your, your arrows are already pointing in the 
positive trajectory, you know, so yeah. if you're in the mid 20s, so that by the time you get to mid 30s or mid 40s, right, that it, it, the narrative gets fatter, your capacities grow, your capacity to synthesize improves, and so forth and so on. So right? the desire to want to know more is uh, the project of self-consciousness looking to fulfill itself. No, I mean, not this fulfill can't itself. No, 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 no. There's no, well, I don't know if this fulfilling itself is ever happening. Oh, okay. Right? Defulfilling itself. Maybe not Anti-fulfilling yeah, yeah, itself. Yeah, taking yeah. yourself out of the equation. Mm -hmm. That's why global, I say is important, because global continuously reminds you that for every one of you, there are 25 billion people who are just not like you, mm -hmm. will never be like you, mm -hmm. ever, ever, ever. Mm -hmm. And you sort of like go, holy camoly. That's, that's a scale impossibility. I mean, because I don't feel the planetary people around me not being like me, but I should. You know, and then you sort of say, well. So I'm singular and unique? Well, what's the argument? Very here? much so. But you're also singular and unique in a very inefficient way because y you have to now build a consciousness to people who are very much not like you. And then all of a sudden, the, the jumping into these other spheres awakens gaps of comprehension, gaps of knowledge, gaps of language, gaps of uh, cognition. Tower of Babel. No, it does. It's not a, that, that's already answers. That's the, the Bible sort of saying it's Babel. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we all have to speak one language and yeah, praise be God, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it's no, 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 God came down and said, don't speak one language, just to, not that it matters. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it, it's not that everyone is speaking Babel, different languages. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like you want to be the resident of the Tower of Babel. We not are residents of the Not God comes and destroys it. Yeah, yeah. Right. That was a, that's the bad. Yeah, that's what right. I'm saying. You know, that was, <laughs> I'm saying. thank you, God, because now we have the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Yes. That's right, yeah. yeah. But We've discovered a, only in the last generation that the Babel is good. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, right. In my generation, you know, everyone had to speak like <laughs> one language. Yes, that's right. And, uh, you know, you had a fight against all the fuddy duddies who insisted that the one language is the only way to go. Yes, that's right. The canon, the singular and, knowledge, you know. the Tower of Babel. You know, so now, so now we, so th but it's a beautiful universe, right, going ahead thinking about uh, the sort of opening of the threads of thought and possibility, which then also results, you know, in a sort of a deconstruction yes. of architecture <coughs> as a discipline, right. of physics as a discipline, of chemistry as a discipline, <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and all these things, uh, you know. And then, uh, uh, you know, maybe we will even see a post-nation state future. It looks like we're doing that probably better, faster than we think. <laughs> well, I don't mean globalization and corporatization of the world. You know, oh, Apple no, running those the guys world. want the nation state. Yeah, it, they want the, the boundary. Self, the nation state is self-destructing against that. Well, they both use it and, and keep right. it. And, and right. Yeah, so it's, it's perfect because data and capital moves easily across yeah, yeah. borders, yeah, but don't. nation states in, ensure yeah. uh, discontinuity in wages. Right. So, That's you right. know, coronavirus doesn't listen to them, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's that's the same. But one can imagine, a po you know, because the nation state's only 180 years, well, 200 years old, isn't it? Maximum, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. the global project also envisages some kind of a post-nation <laughs> state future, isn't it? Yes, I, I would say global, you have to see past certainly the nation state. I, I, I'm not sure what, it doesn't necessarily produce a positive political agenda because partially the post nation no state agenda is sort of an ethnocentrism. It's an even potentially worse type of a thing. No, no, there has to be a better way to do this. There has to be a better way. Yeah, yeah. There yeah, has I'd to be a better way. way. I mean, there is politics. Maybe that's the next problem. semester's <laughs> seminar topic. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe that's, we should do that as a section. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should do this as a section. Section question, that's right. Uh, because, <laughs> I mean, I feel it. I have young kids, and they often enough uh, talk about <laughs> this, you know, you know uh, every day we pummel the impossibilities of climate change, the sort of, uh, sort of impossibilities of cross-cultural communication, the sort of demagoguery of the nation state. Uh, people seem to think that the future is pretty bleak. <coughs> Yeah, b it could be. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very but different from how you and I, when we went to school, we thought the future looked pretty optimistic. It, it was only optimistic because it was predictable. 
whatever. I mean, it seemed like better things were around the corner. And yeah. we were deconstructing science and moving on to better horizons mm -hmm. in spite of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems that. Uh, but I, th I think that, in, once again, that's what I mean. You wonder if you zoom far out, but if you zoom sort of not all the way in, but sort of above, in other words, the uh, optimism that comes from the breakdown of securities in the disciplinary front yeah. is palpable. Yes, I yes, mean, the whole yeah. MIT and other places are, are built around that, you know. Built around what? The, the, the positive that comes out of the breakdown of disciplinary securities. They're breaking down disciplinary securities at MIT? Yeah. Really? Well, I don't know if it's like everywhere, but okay. who, right. who, who, what do you do? Computer science. And what? In other words, I thought you did material. Didn't, weren't you also doing something biology? Uh, I do material science, chemistry, and architecture. Okay, right. Who, who, who does like more than, I mean, what, give me some examples of more than one discipline here in this room. Speak up. Uh, <coughs> chemistry? Chemical engineering and architecture. Yeah. Okay, all right. Got to be more. Um, mechanical, chemical, biological engineering. Ah, see? Okay, all right, more. Mechanical, chemical, biological engineering. Oh. <laughs> See, they even got a name now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. HCI. All right. Computer, say, say for the machine. Uh, uh, computer science and human computer interaction. Okay. This is then the computer people taking over design thinking. Yeah, yeah. that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yeah. Right. So you see this, this uh, you know, people here in the class are already moving in these ways. And, you know, for me, it, it's sort of like scary, right? Because uh -huh. I, I didn't have to undergo, in some sense, thinking about two disciplines. Yeah. I, I did that all after I got tenure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got tenure being a good sort of disciplinary citizen. Yeah, me too. Right? Yeah. And then it was after tenure, I can do whatever I want, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And then it was like, oh, let me move here, let me move there, let me do, do that, yeah, you know, whatever, yeah, yeah. you know. And so I did it sort of on my free will, you know, free time. Yes. Here it's sort of happening in the context of, you know, a pedagogical movement, a pedagogical front, right, as opportunities for young and talented people to rethink their, their relationship to the future. Yep. Right? That's... I mean, I hope that's a sense of optimism about what that can produce. I'm hopeful too. I'm yeah. hopeful <coughs> too. But uh, I mean, like one of the amazing things here at MIT is that, uh, uh, like, the Media Lab is a product of the School of Architecture, it isn't it? They wouldn't say so. No. I know they wouldn't yeah. say so, yeah. but I'll say so. Yeah. I mean, isn't it uh, sort of uh, consequenced by? Some people you know, in the 60s and early 70s uh, doing crazy thinking uh, out of architecture, wasn't it? Origi yes, mm. yeah. I mean, they saw themselves <laughs> as sort of an architecture lab. Yeah, 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 yeah. They saw mm. themselves as an architecture lab, and now it's, of course, a powerhouse in its uh, own right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, that is possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. So all those things are possible, and I think that that's that's the kind of uh, future to think about the future of, let's say, if not the future of life, the future of the university, let's say, mm -hmm. is to think about uh, like it becomes all these kind of, uh, uh, I, I, labs, fine, whatever term you want, but sort of these sort of spaces of congruity mm -hmm. where thinkings mm -hmm. are hybridized, uh, where thinkings are are advanced towards producing uh, new ways of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So that's optimism. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, that's what we're here for. So, mm -hmm. you know, b you know, building that. There is also, you know, goes with that levels of critique. So that's, you know, a secondary project. Right. Right. You know, because it's not all just like do whatever. Right. Right. I mean, of course, you know. So there is a disciplinarity, and there is that's. Exchanges, conversations, sharing require right. uh, interaction or modality that is itself builds confidence 
so in the these conversations. Question is: Should the architectural survey, the global architectural survey, be required of all these sort of transdisciplinary majors on Absolutely. campus? Absolutely. Yes. 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 Why? <laughs> because I'm architecture centric in this <laughs> when it comes down to it. I think that architecture is a great mechanism by which we can see the world. Yeah. You know, yeah. architecture is sort of the medium, if you will. It's like a lens, it's like a glasses. It's not the yeah. only one, but yeah. it's a medium that allows different layers to uh, become into visibility. Right, 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 right. You know. I mean, it is true. Architecture, in that sense, is the state set of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well, we it's, this is a good time for us to perhaps shift the uh, conversation around a little bit. Uh, it's always great to talk to you, Mark, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, good. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Sammy Prouty. We hope you enjoyed the conversation, and if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions for new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us via our website or Instagram. And remember, if you ever want to read up on something we reference in a conversation, the website is complete with a timestamp outline for each episode so you can further stretch your thinking. Thanks again, and until next time, this has been Architecture Talk. <laughs>